Hello. Okay, so I think we can start. Um, hello, Scott. Are you there? Can you hear me? Can everybody hear? You can also comment. So good to see everybody. Hey Scott, hey Aaron, hey Melinda. It's so good to see everybody. Um, somehow in a, in a really good mood. It's an amazing Parsha. Um, so, I guess we'll start here. So, um, in this week's Parsha, which is Parsha Svayishlach, um, this is the Parsha where, uh, where Yaakov... Uh, sends the um, sends the sends the angels or the messengers to his brother, and Yaakov. Just to give the background information, Yaakov and his um, and his twin brother Esav, um, the children of Yitzhak and and Rivka. Oh, someone's trying to hold on. Um, Hold on one second. I won't do this a bunch of times, but okay, good. So um, Yaakov, who is who is also called Yisrael, and Yisrael, uh, uh, this is the parsha where Yaakov gets his name. Yisrael. And Yaakov and Esav are these two brothers that were both in the womb of Rivka. And the Jewish people who are, who are called Yisrael and the country called Israel, and we're called Bnei Yisrael, the sons of Israel, we also descend from Yitzhak and we also descend from Avraham. But the name Yisrael and, and, the, and the name of Beis Yaakov, which is the house of Yaakov, is... Hello, Doris. So is is the is is the name that that or that we're called by also Yehuda, right? When the when there were when the two brothers were initially born, they were twins, and Esav, uh, who's Yaakov's twin brother, he came out first, and then Yaakov came out after, and he grabbed on to the heel of Esav, and so his name is his, Yaakov's name is Heel. And um, Esav, who oh, his descendants are called Edom, was red and hairy. So these are this is already the picture that the that the Torah is setting. So you have these two twins. One of them is Esav, who is um, hairy and red and powerful, and the other one is Yaakov. Whose his name is a heel. So even in English, when you refer to somebody as a heel, it means some like not low as in like bad character, but some humble um, sort of. Uh, in Yiddish, you call it nebach. You know, like some some somebody just doesn't really uh, put themselves out there. It's not such a. It's um, sort of uh, uh, a side character. And that's what that's what the image of 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 the twins. Initially, Rivka has the two twins inside of her, and they're constantly struggling. And she has the prophecy that um, uh, that she receives that 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 there be two nations inside of her, and they'll be constantly struggling with each other. When one is on top, the other one will be on the bottom, and one was on on the bottom, the other one is on top. So you have this image of the of the womb, and you have this image of this struggle, which is like the um, uh, two polar opposites, these two forces: the the force of Esav and the force of Yaakov. 
but deeper than thinking of them just as simply um, <clears throat> two enemies, but they're truly actually brothers, and they're called brothers over and over again. So the emphasis is is their closeness, not their for their the their distance. I mean, of all, uh, Esav and and Yaakov are closer to each other than their than their uncle Ishmael, or um, or um, or uh, or anyone else. So close, the closest in the world to Yaakov, and the closest in the world to Israel, and the closest in the world to the Bnei Yisrael, the children of Israel, and 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 uh, the Yidden, the Jews, is the nation of uh, is the nation of Edom. And Edom is understood as far as on like on a national level is like the West, the the whole if we're saying the whole spirit of the thing the, in the Midrash, which is the uh, the living uh, wisdom of the Jewish people, uh, uh, the whole idea of Rome and the whole idea, uh, i.e., the Western world, is is like this um, uh, complementary force, and it's also in a struggle between the 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 lowly of Yaakov and the uh, uh, triumphant of Esau. So th that's the idea of the empire, and the and the and the one who gets trampled on, right? So you have an empire, and then you have the people that are being uh, s uh, subjected by the empire, and this contrast between the the the, uh, the mighty and the weak is a contrast that goes keeps being expressed through the whole Torah. So even though we think of David and Melech as, meaning uh, King David, as, oh, he was so mighty, really he was the smallest and weakest of the brothers, and he, of his brothers, and he was the one that everyone thought was maybe not even related in the family. And so that's Yaakov, and the same thing with Yehuda, there's the same thing with uh, um, with David, and it's the same thing with um, each of the forces in this world. So the the images that are that the Torah is expressing is first the womb with these two uh, brothers inside struggling already. The idea of a womb is that it doesn't even exist yet, right? The when does a baby exist? The baby is is it only is only perceivable um, once the baby is born, right? <laughs> Once the once the baby is born, then all of a sudden the baby is perceivable. When the baby is in, when the baby or the babies are in the womb, you don't you can't actually perceive the babies. You just see the um, the existence of the, you can uh, you can see the existence of the baby through uh, the the protrusions of of the of the womb. Right since the 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 belly is getting larger, then you know something is growing in there. Since you see these little hands punching and kicking, you know something is in there. But you can't see it itself. The, in Kabbalah, we talk about um, the idea of, of light. And the idea of light being the idea of experiencing something. So uh, in Hebrew, it's called or. And in Kabbalah, whenever you hear about the, uh, the or and the kalim, which is the light and the vessels, they were talking about the experience and the thing with, through wit, through which is experienced. So a vessel, like a bowl, is 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 the thing, and the light is pouring into the bowl. That's like the image that the Torah uses a lot of times to describe what's going on. So, the, 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 for instance, if you want to experience the light of love, right, you have to experience it with a keli. You have to experience it through a vessel. You have to experience it through something. You can't just experience love and and without it being carried um, in a, in in a vessel. For instance, you have love of your mother, or love of your father, and love of your brother, and love of your friend, and love of your lover, and love of uh, love of your dog, and love of the the beauty of the sky, and love of the moment, and love of the whatever it is. But the but but love itself is. You get an idea, a concept of love, and you start to get a full picture of its, of of its being, but only as it, it is sort of peering through these other things. The, only in its it's being delivered 
by the by the kalim of which that which you experience it. The same thing with like the number three. You can never see a three. You could see a number three written on a piece of paper, and then you say that means three, but that's just a symbol that's meaning three. But it, to actually see a three, you need to see three oranges on the table, or you see three horses running through a field, and then you see, you one, two, three, and you see these threes. And then after a while, when you start experiencing more and more and more, you get the idea of what a three is. But you can never actually see the three. A three that doesn't that doesn't exist. So that's like an or, and all the oranges are the keli for the number three. But an orange is a keli for as a vessel for a lot of different things, not just the number. Three, it's the keli for, it delivers um, uh, freshness, it delivers sweetness, it delivers happiness, it can be given from a, a friend, and then it delivers love of a, of a guest uh, or a gift. Hello, bar. So, it's good to see you. So, it, it, each one of these, um, everything in life that we experience it can is is at one time a vessel for many things right so for instance i'm here talking and i could be a vessel for torah and i could be a vessel for uh wisdom and i could be and also i could be you know someone else is listening to it and they're like and or if they're my brother then then i'm also carrying along other things besides from just like here's the parsha and if they're and if they um or if they never heard of any ideas of the Torah, then it's the then I'm delivering like this first uh, impression, and for other people it's a, a very old, uh, it's just one little nuanced impression. But the, but and I and here I am, this little vessel. In the same way, each one of our each one of our lives are we're we're sort of vessels and messengers for a whole bunch of different things. The, the the vessel being the outward experience, the outward projection of who I am, but it, there's an inside as well. So before uh, uh, getting into that, so the the womb is like is like the vessel, and the experience of the world, the experience of the world that we have right now, one mushal in Kabbalah of the experience of the world is that the is that it's the light that is like shining from the source so this so we experience all these different uh experiences in life and we can describe all of that as as i'm not encountering the creator but i'm ca encountering the light that is shining from the creator so this whole world is like an encounter with with the with the light that is emanating from its source like the sun and here's the sun, and then the light is shining out of the sun, and then we receive the light. Initially, the light was inside of the sun, so it's part of the sun. But when we experience it, it's outside of the sun. But then a deeper way of understanding our experience is, is not just the experience of this world is like the light that shines out of the sun, but in truth, it's like the light of the sun while it's still in the sun. So, meaning that it hasn't separated at all from its source. And that's a deeper way to experience life. Uh, and we d are not able, uh, or whatever, maybe we are able. But <clears throat> we're not able to, uh, uh, or I'm not able, <laughs> or whatever. A lot of times we don't experience the, um, the life as the light within the creator like it never left the sun but we experience life which is or is a stand-in for experience we experience life like it's coming out of the creator and sometimes we experience life like we don't even realize that it was ever emanating from its source it's like we experience the light on earth and we don't and we don't even think that it that it's uh that it, we don't even think about where it came from we just are dealing with it that's the deepest part. The, I mean, that's the that's the 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 most surface experience of it. But the deepest part is the light of the sun while it's still in the sun. That this experience of life, I'm totally experiencing life and all the details of life, just as it was. But I don't think that there's this separation, a little dotted line that separates me from the Creator. It's all happening totally within and without any boundaries between me and the Creator. I get to experience just this aspect of the Creator, just this light, 
and I don't get to experience the, you know all the lights in my brain and my feelings and my and my hands and in my toes, but uh, but it's not like it has been separated. It's totally one and connected with the Creator. So that idea is the idea of still being within the womb. So when you have the two twins, which is Yaakov and Esav, still within the womb, they don't even exist yet. They're just part of uh, they're just they're just part of their mother. Once they're born, then they then they're it's like they're out of their source, and then they have an, an individual existence. And when they have this individual existence, then they start to show their character traits. But really, even even hello, Ruven, it's good to see you. Mechaim. Even when we're in um, Even when we're outside of uh, outside of the womb, as we start to show our traits and show uh, uh, what we were capable of, we can trace that back to what was going on even inside the womb, and this is true for uh, for a person, right? Uh, all of the resources that were invested into the person even before they were born and uh, who they were born to and where they were born to and all that is going to play out into what what they're able to uh at Chaim, Chaim Aaron, what they're able to achieve in life and what they're able to uh, um, uh, experience and what they what they bump into is going to have a lot to do with what happened before they were even brought into existence that's true in a in a in a human life but that is like a metaphor for existence itself, right? So whatever is happening here was also is also happening on the in the higher level of like the light within the the light within the sun. So the the symbol of, and I'm not saying symbol like it, but because it's part it's part of the imagery. The, it's very powerful imagery of these two um, uh, brothers, two twin brothers wrestling within within the womb, and then when they come out. The story is that that Esav came out, and then as he came out, Yaakov reached and grabbed his uh, his heel, and so he got the name Esav, and he got the name Yaakov, which is heel, and that's also the the, the it's, that is going to then play out in their whole lives. Meaning, Esav is going to come first, and then Yaakov is going to grab onto him, and he's go- and he's going to. Uh, He's going to wrestle himself to the top, even though everything was stacked against him. That idea that ya- that 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 Yaakov is the one who everything is is small and weak, and everything is stacked against him, is the is the idea of of in this parsha when he gets the name Yisrael, because Yisrael means wrestling with Aleph Lamed, means wrestling with God or wrestling with power. So he was put into this world with a um, a deficiency in his, in how powerful he was, but despite that, he was able to wrestle with power, wrestle with with the setup that Hashem initially uh, set up, and then we saw the deeper will of Hashem once he re- he was able to wrestle to the top. You ha- you have this powerful imagery going on, and this happened in the last par- last parsha of again the brothers. That one of them, the Esav, becomes a man of the field. He becomes very powerful, and he lives by his bow, and he lives by the by the power that he is able to uh, uh, exact on the world. And Yaakov, it says that he was a man in the tents, which means that he was weak. He hung around in the tents. He couldn't take the 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 beat of the sun, and he studied. But he was uh, he was like hanging around with his mother. And and Esav was the was the favorite of his father, and you again have this uh, contrast of of the of the physical uh, prowess of the male body, and then the the diminutive, diminutive uh, prowess of the female body. I'm not saying that that's a discrimination. It's not. It's just that it 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 is physically smaller. That's all that is being said. So the power. Of of um, in Kabbalah, Chesed is, was originally Gedula, and Gevura, which is strength, is Gevura. 
So chesed, which is we use to, to mean love or going out, is also the greatness. I mean, i.e., like the the power. And gevura is the strength, and that's a, f- a feminine uh, quality, which is the strength. So Yaakov has this feminine quality, which is that he initially seems like he's not as large as Asaph. And so you have these two twins. But from the very beginning of the story, you know that the ones that the the one who is overlooked, the one that is grabbing onto the heel, that is 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 the one who Hashem picked, right? So, a lot of times in life, that this is the this is the idea that we think as, uh, but with our human minds, if we're blind like like Yitzhak, that the one that has more power will overcome. But actually, the one that Hashem uh, gives a, uh, a, a quality uh, that is diminutive is actually the one that Hashem has chosen, right? That what it means to be chosen, it means to be given a chisron, given a something that you lack. So for instance, when somebody is, is born and feels that they lack wisdom, right? They don't feel that they are so smart. And the other one is born and feels uh, that they are smart. Why do they feel that they are smart? Is because when they're born, they're quick and they're sharp and they, they're, you know, they're they're, uh, they're picking up. So everyone's oh, it's just smart, smart. But the other, but someone else, it doesn't feel uh, doesn't feel so smart. It's not so good at something. The one who, or or let's say someone feel. And and so, for instance, what happens? The one who feels like he's very smart uh, initially has this fl- flowering of intelligence. But since he doesn't feel that he that he has a lack in the in, in intelligence, uh, then he plateaus at the level of intelligence that he uh, that was natural to him. But um, well, I see, let's say, given to him the resources. But the one who has this feels this lack. Of wisdom, is constantly striving to receive more wisdom, and ne- and because that becomes so part of the person, that they're constantly, 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 constantly searching for more wisdom because they feel like they have this tremendous lack. So as they go through life, the other one plateaus, and the one who was initially had this great lack, then keeps filling it and filling it and filling it and filling it. By the time the years go by. The one who thought he was a fool ends up to be wise, and the one who thought he was wise ends up to be a fool. The same thing with um, with someone who searches for Hashem. The, the, if, if someone feels, oh, uh, so, of course, Hashem. Right? The one, then they have a, a simple understanding. Hello, Tali. The, they have, uh, it's good to see you. Uh, uh, they have a simple understanding of, of Hashem, and they and they don't feel like there's a, like, like they have a lack, right? So therefore, their understanding of Hashem is capped at the at the understanding that they have. But someone who feels like I don't know, I, I don't understand Hashem, I can't figure it, you know, I, 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 where I don't know, you know, and has this tremendous um, deep lack, uh, then they keep searching for Hashem and searching for Hashem and searching for Hashem and searching for Hashem and searching for Hashem. Until they they, they 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 fill their whole this whole vessel with as much light and with as 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 much Torah as they can, until they turn around one day and they're like, I, I've asked so many questions about Hashem. I found so much experience. I I, I ha, I've collected in this bag so much, and that was actually that was actually their gift, right? So initially, what is born into a person where we feel like we have lack. Right, and we think it's a, a tremendous hole in in us. It doesn't mean it's only in Hashem. It doesn't mean it's it's a, a wisdom. It's anything. If someone feels like I'm so poor, right, and then they strive and they strive and they strive and they strive and they keep filling and filling and filling and it's never going to end, you know. And the money keeps piling in and piling. In. They, they look back and they have this gigantic bag of money. But somebody who felt like it says who is rich, the one who feels that the uh, who is happy with what they have. So they don't have a, a big hole of, for wealth, and so they fill it, you know, a little bit in their bag, and then they, <laughs> they're like, uh, they seem to, they're satisfied, and they and they walk off. So what was the bracha? 
um, was the bracha the fact that I was given the resources, or is the bracha, I mean the bracha of my life when I look back, was the bracha the, 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 the kalim that I had, the holes, the things that I thought I lacked, end up when in, in, in reflection, when I look back, the, the, the personality defects of mine that I worked so hard to try to uh, fill and to complete, those were actually the, the gifts. For instance, we say that, um, like, for Moshe Rabbeinu, he, at the end of his life, he says that um, my, my words will flow like rain onto the grasses and, and dew upon the herbs. And he, it's, a, it's a, a very beautiful poem at the end of the Torah. So Moshe Rabbeinu, in the beginning of his life, he said, I, I can't talk. I have no way to. I have no way to speak. I have bad language. So when meaning I have, I'm not so good at talking, and I don't. I'm not, I'm not good with words. Like Scott uh, Scott says, dyslexic, right? So and I don't know. I'm not saying Moshe Rabbeinu was. I'm just saying that he, he he felt like he he wasn't somebody. You pick somebody to if you want uh, someone to speak for God. Pick somebody that can talk well. I can't talk well. So he had this hole. And so through his whole life, he's always trying to find the right way to say something. And by the end of his life, the last moment of his life, Moshe whips out the whole book of Devarim and then ends up with this most beautiful poem. And inside of that poem, he says that my words, which is Torah, will fall upon the earth. And so each, every person in, in their earth, they have a hole there, right? A chisron. And that hole desires to be filled. It wants to be filled i.e. because it wants to fill the hole. Every, it, 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 and what does it fill it with? It fills it with, with Torah, right? And depending on how much of a need there is, that's how much uh, Torah goes in. So a person has, like, for instance, why some, I'm not saying everybody, but, you know, some people, why they go into psychology and then why they go into uh, uh, into uh, psychotherapy as a, as a therapist is because of, of their own need for, for that, right? And that's not a negative thing in any way. But they, because they find holes in their soul and in their and in their character, and they feel the need to fill it and to and to have the medicine and the wisdom to be able to uh, uh, work with, to fill it to fix it. That's what that's what drives them to uh, to the to methods to, of which to fix it, right? And then afterwards, they end up. Um, to be able to be the one to help another one, to help up someone else who has that. The same thing with Torah, is that uh, that someone strives and strives and strives because they feel they have a lack of Torah, and then when they finish with their big bag of wisdom, what was that? It was a gift, and that gift was the Torah that they now have that they can teach everybody about all the questions that they asked. If I never had a question and if I never had a doubt, then uh, about about Hashem, or I never had a doubt about which way to go in life, and I was and I was and I was like perfectly confident. Then I would never have anything to share with anyone because I would just be like a, um, and this would be beautiful. I would just be like a beast in the field, and you know, I would just uh, be uh, completely natural and acting. But because I feel like I have this, I have this lack, and I felt like I needed something. I, I look back retroactively on my life and I see the things that I thought I lacked were the things that caused me to collect all of whatever it is. And so therefore the 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 part of us that is like the heel and that is like the lower aspect, the Yaakov, eventually struggles to the to the top. Right? And that this idea of these two twins is 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 that that Yaakov and Esav are are bounded together. They're actually literally twins. It should be like clear. They're not enemies or pushed away. They're, although in the story they're fighting with each other, but that's the nature of it. When one is on top, the other one is on the bottom, and one is on bottom, one is on top. But the uh, uh, um, they're both um, sharing and giving to each other. But the one who initially reaches his zenith. First was not actually is not the one that was chosen by Hashem, the one that that puffs up first is actually going to be superseded by the by the lower aspects, and we have that in our in our lives as well, right? So we think that our life is about something, right? It's all all the things that we were good at, and all the things that were obviously that we got you know awards and somebody's clapping for us, the things that we were immensely talented, and so. 
um, you know, and therefore I can I, I'm useful and that right. So and I and I think that my life was about I don't know whatever. Uh, I, you know, someone thinks that that their life was about uh, uh, being a singer because that's the, that's that was the that was the production of themselves, the project of themselves. But then, as they go through life, they say, "Wow, I wasn't so much a singer. I was I was more of a father, right? Or I thought that I was a uh, and that it was diminutive, right? Or I thought I was a big." Head of the house, and I realized that in the end, uh, uh, I had a, I had a um, a secret miss, uh, mission, right? As, uh, like my life had a outward journey that was like I do this and this and this, but along the way, there was a there was a lower journey that was going on, and then uh, and that lower journey was all the things that I wasn't paying attention to. Um, and that's what it means to be akev, like in Parshas akev, the, um, uh, the, um, the redemption of our of our souls is when we look at all the things that are falling by the uh, uh, are being ignored that are that are falling down. But I see these things, and I realize that these are the these. This is the um, these little moments that I that I took for granted or didn't think that were so important, when I look back in my life, I see that a lot of the things that I thought were unimportant were actually the important things, and the things that I thought were so important were actually the unimportant things. Like in the Midrash, one of the sons of the, uh, the rabbis in the Mishnaya, so he passes away, and he, well, he has a, he passes away very quickly, and then he's resuscitated. So when he comes back to life, he said, what did you see in the other world? So he says that it's an upside-down world. Everyone that is big that here is small, and everyone that is small here is big. Meaning that the amount of resources that goes into a person to make uh, them in this world um, the ones of this world that come into world into the world with such little resources, their um, the power of their souls, uh, i.e., the power that is invested in them to struggle through life and to rise, is so much greater. I.e., their their as opposed to the resources that are going into them, but their potential. And the same thing is with Yaakov, and so he comes out uh, second, but. The Midrash says that he was the reason he came out second was because he came in first, right? He came in first, and then Esav, and then Esav comes out, and then Yaakov, and that's the idea that the that the finish is the original thought. So when somebody is building a uh, house, they have a vision of what they want to create, and then they they go through the whole process of of erecting it, right? And but what is the what is all the whole fanfare of that whole thing was really just to get to the was really just to get to the to the end to get to the completion of it and a lot of times the completion of it is the one that we think is is the thing that is that we overlook right the 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 finishing touch is the things that we're ignoring right now not that it's not just the finishing touch for instance a uh, Yaakov will eventually struggle to the struggle to the top. And so we have in we have in us these two twins. Not just that the Jewish people are Yaakov and Esav is 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 uh, uh the Roman Empire. <clears throat> but reflected in Yaakov is Esav and reflected in Esav is Yaakov. There's an interinclusion with uh, uh within them, right? When one is down, the other one is up. Right, so like, let's say if if I if uh, I don't know if I can, you know, so with with a single entity, here's one side and here's the other. So when this one flips and this one flips, if there are two, that's why it's automatic. When one is up, one is down, and the other one is down, one is up. If it's two, if they were two separate things, then it's not necessarily so, right? It's it, you know, one goes up, this one can also go up, but it's only when they're completely bounded together. And these two sides are one and the same. That that phenomena happens. That when one is up, one is automatically down, and that's part of that's part of us. So in the same way that Asav is like this explosion of of this is who I am, and I'm with my bow, I'm going to take over the world. 
when that when that emerges in you, and I'm not this is not a speech about how bad that is, because there's an element of us that we need to put out into the world and push ourselves into the world and use our power that Hashem uh, put into it. It's not, but when that is happening, so then the Yaakov is down, and when the and when uh, someone is humble and is receiving and is and is ready to hear, all of a sudden the aggrandizement of his big project is 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 on the floor, right? It's just the nature of this, uh, 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 you know, of this quality. So <clears throat> you have these two uh, sides of a person. One being the side of that is. Uh, with my bow, I'm going, like it says that, um, uh, uh, that, that Esav, he, um, and who is the character of Esav? Esav, according to the Midrash, is the one who uh, is outwardly religious. So what he does is he goes to his father, and he's trying to impress his father. He's trying to show his father how smart he is. He's trying to show his father how pious he is. He's trying to show his father how good he is, and so therefore he in the midrash in the midrash he goes to his father and he says, um, "How do I tithe salt? How do I tithe uh, straw? All these things that you don't need to do. These extra look how pious I am." But he's doing it to show to his father that he's pious to act in a pious way because he's the the initial surface emergence. Of the of 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 the self, right? But at and Yaakov, his attitude was: Listen, why do I have to impress my father? If I'm impressive, so then good. Then I'll impress him. If I'm not impressive, I don't want him to think I'm impressive. If I'm not impressive, so I'm just going to be who I am, and whatever that is, is that's that's the way it's going to be. Now, uh, Yitzchak said to himself that that was the, that was the right way to be uh, Asaph's way was the right way right it's not about um just being yourself but it's a it, 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 you need to you need to be the you need to uh, be the very best that you are and this is true in the creation of a person too that we have both of these within us and at first the Asaph needs to emerge at first Asaph needs to show up and what does that mean? At first, when someone, you know, is trying to get control of themselves and to and to um, and to learn, it's this this way of Asaf is is correct, right? Of let me try to show everyone I, like I want that I want to be a good person, right? So give me a list of what is a good person, and I'm going to try to act that way as much as possible. Right and to impress everyone about how uh, good I am, and and what that is is it's a, it's a it's a fake person that you're creating, right? It's not really you, it's the best possible you that could ever exist, and with your power you force that force yourself into that position where you're as pious as you possibly can be, where you do uh, every stringency that is possible, and the whole time you're trying to show and like we could say in the Jewish. Uh, tradition in the Jewish religion, your Abba is is Hashem, right? So uh, your father is is Hashem. So in the way that the, the in this it's it's a kind of a special relationship. The Jewish people are not like a nation. We're not we're not like a religion. We have a, we have it's a uh, we have a religion, and we also have a nation. But it's a more like a family. It's a family that has uh, that has uh, land and a family that has its own religion and a family. But the way that Jews relate to, you know, to one another is like a family. You can't you can't uh, even if you get kicked out of the house, you're still a brother and and you're still a sister. And if you want to if you want to join the family, you can join the family too. You can also join the family, the, uh, uh, and that's possible too. But it, but the the way in which we act is like a family, and the father of the family is not Avram Yitzchak or Yaakov, but the father of the family is Hashem, and so it meant, and that's a special kind of thing. If you look at the the uh, I don't know theologies and religions of the world, to relate to the Creator as part of your family, as an Abba, is a special is a special uh, beautiful thing. And um, it's not uh, the and 
ones who drink from the source of Torah also have that idea too. But we, it's like literally like a like an Abba. <laughs> We're like the kids. So what is the first that Esav is always trying to impress his father, i.e. In the, in the relationship of us with Hashem, it's like the first stage in being close to Hashem is finding out what he thinks is impressive in the mitzvahs and trying to be as stringent as possible, right, to try to impress your Abba. And initially, that's the right way, that's the right way to be, right? Because all of these grooves and, I mean, these actions that you do are, are building habits to, to uh, like, chokek, to engrave within you the, 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 uh, the mitzvah. But then at a certain point, the things that you weren't, uh, the other part of you, the Yaakov, the heel, the things that you were ignoring, they start to, they start to rise up. And then you enter into this stage where you have to think like Yaakov. You're like, if I'm impressive, then I'm impressive. And if I'm not impressive, then I'm not impressive. But I need to be myself. I need to know what I truly am. But the Yaakov stage comes after. The first stage is really, is actually an ace of stage. It, 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 and the reason is, is because you can't appreciate Yaakov. You can't appreciate who you really are uh, uh, without trying to find the the fake good, the fake good part of you, right? So, the Baal Shem Tov talks about the Hachnaa, the Havdala, and the Hamtaka. The Hachnaa is the submission and the and the humility. The Havdala is the separation, and the Hamtaka is the sweetening. And then all avoda and all work in this world, it goes through these stages. And, and the Shnei Luchotabrit, the Shalach HaKadosh also talks about it. He talks about the, the Shtika, Badika, and Chashika, which is the silence, the searching, and, and the kiss. Meaning that, that a person needs to go through this, this first as is, is, is a humility. If you want to accomplish anything, you the the there's no, the first stage is not an arrogant stage. The first stage is is humility, meaning the humility to listen to another person or the humility to realize that you don't know everything. If you want to learn a new new piece of information, the first thing is to be humble. You don't know anything. If you can't do that, you're never going to receive a new w- wisdom. But the the first stage is the hachna. The second stage is the havdalah, the separation. And that separation is where you separate from, from you say, what's the good part? And you push away the whatever is not the good part of you, which is kind of like this ace of stage of, of enacting a perfect, uh, attempting to enact a perfect self, right? Something that is even more perfect than what you are so that you can rise up and and with that power, it's a spiritual it's a spiritual power. It, what it says uh, is that the is is but this is but it, it's a spiritual power is oz in Hebrew, which is the strength of his bow, right? His keshet of Esav is a is is a hunter. The strength is his is his spiritual um, perfection that he's that he's rising to. Right? Not that he's uh, that he's a he's he's such a bad guy. It's that he's 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 rising up in power and in spiritual and holy good power, and so so Yitzhak is, is says this is the way to go. He's 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 happy with it because it's true. It is the way to go. <clears throat> For instance, but it's also it's also superficial, and what that's compared to is Edom. Edom is is Rome, and the the signet of Rome, the Roman legion that attacked the uh, Israel, uh, their flags was the boar's head, the pig, and in and in Torah the pig is not a kosher animal. And the reason it says it's specifically like all a lot of co- animal, you know, uh, uh, you know, snakes are not kosher, and and um, bugs are not kosher, lots of kosher, but the pig becomes like a totally not kosher. The reason why he's totally not kosher is because he's almost kosher. The re- so the Midrash says it's because the pig has split hooves, uh, but he doesn't chew his cud. And so the two uh, ways to, de- to determine the kosher animal is the split hooves and chewing the cud. The split hooves is the outer, and the chewing the cud is the inner. So if when you look at an animal, you can only really immediately tell the split hooves, the, the, uh, that sign. 
which is the outer sign, outer religious action. The chewing the cud is the inner kosher, right? And so the pig, you can't, you, hello, Joel, it's so good to see you. So the pig, you can't really, uh, you can't really tell until you do a deep inner investigation on, on, onto the inside. Like, for instance, to chew the cud, it means to go through these, um, this periods of going through exile and, and redemption, right? It says that, that the Jewish people were chewed, uh, uh, chewed up. Hello, Joel. I don't remember. The Jewish people were chewed up like a, like a goat, right? A lot of the mashalim, a lot of the metaphors in the Torah are like, uh, go according to the goats and sheep. So, because we're a shepherd people. And so the sheep chews its cud and it swallows it up, swallows it, and then it spits it back up. It says that it's the same word of, of going out of Egypt and then going back into Egypt and going out of Egypt. It's this process, is, and, and that is the, the uh, it's not just about how kosher you are on the outside, but the internal uh, the internal kashras, which is this, which is the ability to go through these um, the back and forth of exile and, and redemption of geula and <coughs> and galut and and galus, which is Egypt, and you see from the in the stories of of, of the Torah, you see that 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 Avram goes down into Egypt, and then he comes back up, and then Yaakov goes into Egypt, and then comes back up and even in later in the time of uh, in the later time of the Tanakh people are 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 saying they want to go back to Egypt and they actually Jews did go back to Egypt and then coming back and so not just about Egypt but constantly going in and out of from exile to redemption that that ability is an inner spiritual ability so in the boar right is the is 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 the ability to show an outward religiousness like I'm so religious look how pious I am, but inside is not going through those stages of 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 Gullus and and Gula of redemption and exile. It doesn't have that the 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 inner uh, ability, and that's why it says the the Ramban the Nachmanides says that a person could keep all of the Torah and still be a bore within it. He'll keep all of the mitzvot and still be a bore. Because a bore is the one that shows an outward religion, an outward spirituality, an outward piousness, but inside is not going through that process. Is not is not realizing that they are still in exile and they need to move into redemption. Is just uh, uh, happy with their outward presentation. Just like somebody could do all of the mitzvahs, but still be uh, uh, bore, meaning not kosher, because inside they're not they're, uh, they're It's all about their power, and they're not going through the the inner quality, which is what like reflected in the animal. So, it says that um, in the Gemara that the that the, that it takes sixty days for a bore or for uh, to. Uh, be born to gestate, and it takes sixty days for an apple to uh, come to fruition, to be to fruit. So each one of these both have sixty days, and the Hebrew letter is a samach, right? So the samach is like a kesha, it's like a bow, meaning it's like the power, and the samach is also shaped like an apple, right? So these are the two ways in which the 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 samach uh, the uh, and the, which is the numerical value in gematria of 60 it's it's the, it's these two uh, gestation periods of 60 which is samach which is circle which is bow and they could go either way so they it's like a twin like asav meaning the bow and yakov meaning the apple whether this is going to be something that you attack with or something that you're that that is has a shell on the outside, but is alive and life-giving. That it has the seed on the inside, or is it just, uh, or is it just a, or is it just a shell? And so, even though you could critique Asav, initially this stage is only critique when you're when you're done with it, right? So the first stage, of, which is an Asav stage, which is being more pious than you actually are, is is a correct stage, which is the stage of Havdalah, or as the Shalah HaKodesh uh, calls it, of Bidika, of searching, where someone tries to find, what is, who, 
tries to make themselves into the very best that, uh, person they could possibly be, even though it's artificial, right? As pious as possible, as holy as possible, without uh, with disregarding aspects of themselves to form this, to show their Abba, like Esav is doing, to show your, your father how much you want to be good, how much you want to be pious. But at a certain point, uh, uh, when you when you reach the limits of your uh, of, of your power, then all of a sudden um, your your life seems to uh, then start to dwell on what is Yaakov. What are the things that you left out? What were the things that you didn't want to become because you uh, you love Scott that you didn't want to that you that you were ignoring the akev the heel the things you threw on threw on the side. And you realize a lot of the things that you're going through life trying to accomplish, you were ignoring some other things. Now, I'm not just talking about inside of yourself, but around you, right? I wanted to be a great writer. Uh, I'm not talking about myself, but uh, I wanted to be a great writer. And then I realized that I was throwing to the side to be a great son, right? And I realized, wait, this is how... Th I wanted to be uh, uh, a, a great mother, and then I realized what kind of sister I was. Right, this was being tossed to Acab. I wanted to show how religious I was and and impress my father in heaven, you know, my the, my creator. And then I was ignoring what um, the gifts that he gave me, the things that I was lacking in. And so then this, what it was initially seems to be the the Acab, the things that I didn't want to look at, then starts to rise. And when when Yaakov comes, then he topples. Uh, he topples Esav. That's true in our in our own life, right? Initially, Esav explodes onto the scene with his. Uh, and again, um, in the midrash, he's understood as a very religious person, an overly religious person. And then you realize, listen, it's not about being as overly religious as possible, but it's about like what Yaakov said initially in his life. It's about if I I will be what Hashem made me. And if that's impressive, good. And if not, what do I care? I, I have to know who I am. It's like what uh, Reb Zusha of Anapoli said, that when I go t up to Shemayim, I'm not going, they're not going to ask me, why weren't you like Moshe Rabbeinu? And why weren't you like uh, Davra Melech? They're going to ask me, why weren't you like Zusha? Right? So even if I was able to accomplish being Moshe Rabbeinu, right? Even if I, which is not possible, but even if I, I put on this whole facade and I, and I, and I reached to be uh, um, some great prophet, but that, that wasn't what I was supposed to be, right? So they, so it's not just like they're not going to ask me, so therefore I, I don't have to say. Even if I was able to accomplish it, they're going to ask me, hey, listen, yeah, I know you were a big shot, but, wh that's an, but why weren't you yourself, right? It was the same thing with someone um, uh, becoming a wagon driver instead of a rabbi and that kind of uh, uh, thing. Is is One has to understand uh, who who they are, but that we can only understand who we are if we go through the the stage of trying to be even better than we are, which is the stage of Asaph. And so, it although Yaakov's um, maybe his path was the is was the original uh, intent that Hashem wants us to get to, be meaning if I'm impressive, I want to be myself. If that's impressive, good. If that's not impressive, whatever. The, the, that that stage is that is the holiest stage. That is the stage where you trust the Creator that He created you in such a way that this is what th uh, th that this is what you were meant for. But how do you know how good you are? How do you know how, what your what your capacities are? So you go through this stage of Asav where you're where you're trying to be even trying to do even more than you actually can do. You're stretching your boundaries to their to their limits. So that you can, so that you can know what you are. If not, then I would just assume that whatever I was when I was 15 and all of my issues, that was all that I'll ever be. And therefore, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go through. I one time saw a, a post. I think it was on Human Humans of New York or something like that, where um, there was a, a woman and she was there and she was saying, "Everyone told me in the beginning of my life that I should be myself." But after a while, I realized that being myself, I was, I was by being myself, I was preventing myself 
to become the self that I could be, right? By just being myself at whatever I was right now, I was preventing the possibilities of what I could be in the future. And then I realized to be myself, I need to, I, I, I want to work towards an even better self, which at that point is not yourself. So in that way, Asaph comes first. He rises on top. He comes out of the womb first. And then the uh, Yaakov emerges. So in our lives, we go through this stage. It's kind of like going up a mountain and going down a mountain. We rise up, and this is almost, and then we, and then we, and then we come back to uh, what Hashem really wanted of us, which is which is Yaakov. Although we, it's hard to see that in the beginning. It's hard to see that, um, and this is, I guess, goes to. It's hard to lose, right? Uh, it's it, it's it. it When someone wants to win every conversation, right? So in the beginning of your life, they 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 win and win and win and win and win every single conversation, and they're happy that they won every conversation, right? That they're, you know, if someone asked them a question and they didn't know it, they made something up, right? so that they should never be in the position where wow, you don't know anything, or you know, if they got into an argument with someone, they they're trying to win every single thing, or if they're in business, they want to make sure they come out with the best deal on every single thing or if the right and this is the 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 the, the asap thing but the real wisdom is the yakov wisdom to know how to be the heel to know how to know yes like the ratsu vishuv like tali says and like the angels going up and down on the ladder it's it's to know when to how to lose which is the deeper wisdom of of the rest of your life the beginning part of your life is you're trying to learn how to win Right, and of how to how to not fall, not to be destroyed in this world, how to make something of yourself. But the after after that, the in other words, how to how to how to get right. But then the second part of life, which is the which is the ultimate, which is meaning the thing that was, which which is how to let go, right. So, what is Hashem teaching us? Hashem is teaching us that I think of my life, and I think of my life as a some sort of journey of where I'm, uh, uh, you know, the project of me, right? And then I, and I, you know, here I am, I emerge, and I'm, and I made it, or whatever, and then I, and then I, and then I realize that all, let's say, let's say the person was trying to accomplish was wisdom, which is, well, you know, this is the the Torah and, and Jewish people, so, Right, but uh, there could be other goals. A person could, they could want to be rich, right, or they could want to be um, powerfully athletic, or they could want to, um, <coughs> they want to, um, um, you know, travel everywhere, whatever it is that you want to that you want to do, or um, have have uh, hundreds of partners, or whatever accomplishment someone wants to make. At a certain point. You 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 reach your your zenith, and then uh, you have to start letting go, right? So, if you're if you all the wisdom that I that that I uh, amassed, all of a sudden my wisdom starts to I start to forget things, and I start to have to let go of things, and I have to and I remember the things that really matter, and I let go of all the things that I was trying to know more than what I needed to know. Right, like a million books, like like uh, King Shlomo says, you know, beware of writing a million books. I mean, I want to know this, and I want to know everything. And that's, what are the real things that are, that really matter in this world? What is what is it that I really need to know? And all of a sudden, it starts to narrow down. The same thing with someone who wanted to be powerful and strong; they can be as powerful as they want, and then their strength starts to weaken. The same thing that that as we go back to it, we come from our Creator, and then we go back to our Creator. And and during our lives, we're, it's 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 partly a a journey of 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 the power, and partly a journey of 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 of, of letting go, right? But it's not just uh, uh, an idea of letting go, but in our life, we can look back on our life and we say, wow, I won that battle, but now I see about the huge schism I caused by winning. So you go back and you fix it by losing, right? So you got into an argument with someone and you won, and now you don't talk. So you go back and you and you say you're sorry and, and you lose. And then that was the real winning, right? But in the beginning of your life, the real winning is... Uh, is always is always winning everything, right? 
And then uh, the winning was always getting the best deal. And then I realized that, no, maybe not that it's always getting the best deal. Sometimes letting someone else have the better part of the deal was the, was, was the real gift to me, not just to them. And you can see over and over again how all those aspects, and that's the idea of Yaakov. So Yaakov, like it says, is the man of the tents who's learning wisdom, and he's with his mother. And Esav is the man of the field. And so he's trying to win, even when we're talking about religiously, of being so righteous and being so uh, pious. And then Yaakov realizes, i.e. the part of us that is Yaakov, and the part in Yaakov that is Yaakov, because Yaakov has a Yaakov inside of him and an Esav inside of him, and Esav has an Esav and a Yaakov. And, and, so, and so do we. And I realize... It's not just about how righteous I am. What are the parts that I'm not so uh, righteous? And I need to bring myself into this equilibrium, right? To know what is Hashem, what are the, the thing that Hashem actually wants. He doesn't want me to be perfect about every single thing because if I'm perfect about every single thing, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not spending time on the thing that I need to spend time on. What, are the, what, what is it that Hashem wants me to do? And I start to ask that. And that is a process. It's almost like a losing, Right? I have to let go of certain things so that I can undo what I need, so I can focus on what I truly am, right? And that was Yaakov's initial uh, uh, genius. But that genius only comes after Esav, after going through the process of, of being great. So here we have the, the in this week's Parsha, we have the meeting of, of them. So it happens in two, it happens in two stages. The... First, Yaakov is, um, he realizes that Esav is coming, and this is going to be the show, the, like in this Parsha, it's the showdown between Yaakov and Esav. It's like this, dun, 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 right? So if we were following on the other uh, uh, Parsha, Parsha Yod, Yaakov went and he, um, he, uh, he's, he tricked his father, so to speak, and he got the uh, he got the birthright, right? And when he when he went and got the birthright, he enraged Esav, and that's the idea that that uh, that Yaakov will eventually uh, overcome. And and when that happens, uh, Esav rebels against that, right? So in the beginning, uh, in yourself, you uh, feel that, right? You feel the slipping of your power, and you feel the call to address the things that you overlooked, and you feel the uh, the, the realization that life's not about winning, and the, and and it's not about <laughs> losing everything, but it's also not about winning everything. And I need to know what are the things that I that I need to lose in, and I need to know what are the things that I that I need to win in, and what what Hashem wants of me. And when you realize that, that there's a big rebellion with Asaph, right? It's just like that's like the the moment. And there you go on this. Uh, uh, a person might go on like a rebellion against that and try to have as much power. But uh, but it's already done. Yaakov is already. Um, going on top. He's already he's already succeeding, right? Then Asa will have his last uh his last fight. So the fascinating thing is why Yitzhak is is fooled by um by Yaakov. In fact he says it's the voice of Yaakov, but it's the hands of Asa. So what is what is the uh uh, what is the the vision there? He's supposed to be giving the bracha to Esav, and he's not supposed to be giving the bracha to Yaakov. And before then, Yaakov uh, and Esav were like these two versions of themselves, both uh, making extremes of themselves to twin off the other one, right? One going this way, one going that way, just because they were in this, uh, they, because they were inseparable in, in, in that way. And, and um, Yitzhak and, and Rivka were talking about them. And Rivka, the mother, was saying, Yaakov is the one. I know he looks little, and I know, he's, uh, but Yaakov is the one. And, and Yitzhak was, no, Esav is the one. Look how pious he is. Look how strong spiritually he is. Look how he's so much of a better person than Yaakov. And Rivka was like, no, 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 because Yaakov is the real person. Esav is a show. It's a show. And that, uh, but um, 
Yitzhak didn't agree. He says, this is not a show. It's, uh, he, 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 in this life, you have to accomplish something. The whole point of coming down into this world, because Yitzhak is Gevura, his whole life was, it says that he was, he was literally Gevura, meaning strength. He was the embodiment of, of strength. It's the whole purpose, purpose, not the purpose, the whole purpose of this world is to do something in this world. And look at him. He's, a, he's, he's, he's accomplishing things. Asaph's accomplishing. What is, is, um, what is Yaakov doing? He's just sitting around. And and that's not the way. It is. If you wanted to sit around, you could just sit around inside of the womb. You could sit around, uh, you know. What is, you know? It's, and Rivka was like, no, 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 because because Yaakov is the one. He's he's he's. It, it's going to be him. So when she she told her son Yaakov to put on fur on his arms. So that he would look like he would feel. So Yitzhak was blind, so that he would feel like like. Uh, so look, look at this image of a blind father and a and a and a mother that can see. And Yitzhak, he's he's blinded, but he's pure. He's he's gevura, and he he's going for uh, for for Asaph. The mother says to the son. You put on these hands of Asaph, and you go to your father. And and Yitzhak then says, it's the voice of Yaakov, and it's the hands of Asaph, meaning that he knows exactly who it is. And he still gives the brach. He wasn't tricked, because if you the brach would really want to count if it was a, if it was subterfuge. He realized it was Yaakov, but this was the sign from the mother. Look, Yaakov is willing to put on the outer appearance of Asaph to accomplish something in this world. So when he showed him that, then he he uh, Yitzhak said, "Okay, he, you're right. He he is the one." I thought he wasn't willing to do anything, but if he's willing to do something in this world and put himself out there, then he'll have both. And since Esav never showed himself to have anything inside, right? If Esav would come and speak with the voice of Yaakov, meaning with his humility and his and his lo- and his and his smallness, and he's willing to. Uh, to lose, and is willing to to receive, and is willing to 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 um, to be quiet. Then Esav could have gotten the bracha. But since he wasn't willing, and since he had no inside, just like the boar that only has the the outward signs but doesn't have the inside, and ya- and Yaakov proved that he, although he was so inward, he was also willing to. On the surface, he was willing to put do something in this world, and when he did that, then he got the bracha. So then he he leaves, and he, and from then on, Yaakov took it as his mission that he had to deal with this actual world. And so you see, his whole life is reflected. He's always dealing with all of this nonsense, and he's and he's uh, with flocks and and with uh, scams, and and he's dealing with very 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 very. He's he's making an impact into this world. Even though he wanted to be hanging out in the tents with his mother, now he's he's putting his effort in, and he's and he's it's not him, but he's doing it, and he's and he, so he's doing it to an extreme, right? It's not even really Yaakov. It says that the only years that were that were good and beautiful to Yaakov was when he was finally in Egypt and he could just sit there studying, <laughs> right? Because this is what he wanted the whole time. But his the, the, the that's what he wanted. But he and at this moment in life he, he knew he had to he had to be Asif. What does that Asif mean? It means he, that he had to to do to 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 go overboard, an exaggerated version of himself, but constantly putting himself into the physical world to counteract uh, whatever weakness he he might have had that he wasn't so that he would be a twin himself that he would have both, and so you see that even the night before uh, he's encounter so so then finally he's going to meet Asa. The Asa is coming with so many uh, four hundred armed guys, and Yaakov is preparing for the war, and and Yaakov. Is, but he still, ha, how does he know that he is, can be Yaakov? He needs to constantly be like Esav, in, in meaning in this world, and in an exaggerated sense, meaning even better than he could be. And so he has a bunch of vessels, a bunch of uh, uh, vessels, literally, of Kalim, that are sitting across the river, and he goes back in the middle of the night to go get them, meaning that he thinks that it's so important, the, the interacting with the with physical things in this world that he doesn't want to lose a single vessel. This is like total 
Asav that he's trying to that everything in this world is he's trying to he doesn't want to lose even these vessels even the superficial the kalim the thing which which is for the people that weren't here we're talking about the light and the kalim the light is the experience and the kalim is the vessel so the thing even the things with which you experience Hashem through I mean the kalim of this world the physical this whole experience here even that was so important to him and he runs back to the to the to the to the um, uh, across the river and it's there that he encounters and he wrestles with the angel and um, some people say it's wrestling with Hashem and in our tradition we say it's wrestling with the angel of Esav and then after he wrestles with the angel of Esav and we'll go back to that then he encounters Esav and they have this moment where they kiss and that's the the full image of these twin brothers so you have in the womb and then you have as they come out of the room and they show themselves as one in the in the tent and one in the uh, in the field as the hunter and one in is the tent in uh, with with his with his mother and then you have the 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 uh, the, the bachor uh, um, switching to Yaakov and then the blessing from Yitzchak and then you have the the uh, the encounter. Uh, on the side of the river, where the where he struggles with with Asaph's angel, and then you have this moment where they finally meet. Those should all, like it says in the, uh, in our tradition, that that uh, in every generation a person should imagine themselves uh, going out of Egypt, meaning that the purpose of the Torah telling these stories and, and sharing this is not a uh, uh, a um, uh, it's not a textbook or something like that, and it's not a uh, news report. It's meant so that you can picture in your mind these images, and that you can uh, you, uh, so that the his the prehistory of man or whatever you want to call it is in is 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 in your head. So you have these twins, and and the story is like one giant long story of these two of these twins. Eventually, they kiss and they meet. And that's like the ultimate, but 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 Yaakov prevailed, right? And and Yaakov prevails in the end, and and um, and Esav kisses him, and what it means by he kisses him, he embraced him, and he and he loved him, and he was happy that he won, right? And this, this is the same thing within yourself. So when, eventually, what will be like a struggle with the Esav inside of you to move into Yaakov and to eventually become Yisrael. Eventually, uh, at first, Esav will have a big rebellion, but eventually Esav will be so happy, right? He'll be, he's, he's, he's happy that, that, that Yaakov prevailed. He's, he kisses him, meaning uh, like, um, uh, like Reb Shimon bar Yochai said, that it's in the nature of Esav was to hate Yaakov, Right. So Scott says that Yaakov bows seven times. He actually says that in the time of, uh, I'll go back to Shimon Baruch Hai. He actually says that in the time of Esther, um, uh, um, Mordechai wouldn't bow down to Haman in, in Purim, and uh, it, because he said that he wouldn't bow down to a man. And then they said, "Wait a second! Your your uh, ancestor Yaakov bowed down to my ancestor Esav because ya- uh, Haman was an ancestor of Amalek, which is the the um, the son of the grandson of Esav, who's a descendant of Esav. So he um, uh, um." Uh, uh, so he says that he wants to uh, that he won't bow down. And they said, "Well, your ancestor bowed down, right? Um, right? It's a it's a good point. Yaakov is Yaakov is uh, is um, Yaakov keeps is bowing down, right? And all of a sudden, um, uh, uh, um, I don't know. I'm losing my." Uh, 
And so Mordechai got it. So Mordechai doesn't, and Mordechai is refusing. He's actually risking his life. He won't bow down to Haman. And so they, so they say to the people that are bowing down, so they say to Mordechai, you bow, you bow, you bow, uh, you know, Yaakov bowed down to Asaph. Why, why are you so, you know, so he says, actually, I'm not, um, I'm from the, uh, the tribe of Binyamin. And Binyamin was in the womb at that time. So Binyamin never bowed down to Asaph, so I'm not going to bow down. And there's a reference again to the womb. Meaning that 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 he is it's the light within the sun, right? So I'm not going to be bowing down to some entity, which is the idea not only of Binyamin but the idea of Yehuda. Which uh, I was asked um, uh, once, um, how come Jews won't bow down to other entities, right? Um, it's just a matter of respect. This was what somebody asked me, which is very deep. I'm not, I'm not insulting it. It's just a matter of respect, right? So, for instance, um, you will bow down to, right? What is what does it mean to have a god? I mean, you, um, you could have money. Someone could worship money. Someone could worship love. Someone could worship a mountain, and then that would be their god. As it means the thing with which you uh, would bend your knee, the thing with which you would bow down to, the thing with which you're subservient to, right? Uh, that it, right? So, why won't Jews bow down to? Uh, it's uh, you bow down to, of course, the Creator, but also the Sun is much more powerful and greater than you, and your whole entire life is coming from the energy of the Sun, and you won't bow down to it. You won't admit that it is a uh, it, it is an entity that has power over you, right? And it is the same, and that is the this idea of um, of Yehuda. And of and of the Jews that we won't bow down to any entity, right? What, what, uh, why not? It's because the the it's the whole experience is this is the is the light within the sun. So I don't know if I get too too much into it, but the entities of uh, uh, of this world, the Torah sees things in a, in a kind of an interesting way. So, like for instance, we have in Hebrew we have the word teva. Is for nature, but that word is not the original word. There is no word for nature. There is no nature in, in Torah. The entire world is, there's no nature and then something else. The entire world is the creation of the, of the creator. And, the, and how do we know there's a creator? There's no, it's not a thing about proof. The proof is that it, is, it doesn't need any words or any explanations or any proofs or any evidence. The entire world is evidence. Whatever is the source of all this, wherever this is coming from, is the only thing that we that we bow to. That's the only thing. Everything else is an, is an entity within this world. So rather than seeing things as a hierarchy, you're seeing everything as 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 entities of relationship. So, for instance, we have Shalom Aleichem, where we welcome the angels. We receive blessings and then we let them go, but there it's it's not they, we're not going to bow down to them. The same thing with the sun. We can uh, we'll bless the creator through the sun. We'll bless the moon and we'll bless the, all these brachas. We we'll interact with every entity, but they, they, we are all sitting in an equal circle around the creator. There's not anything that that a yid should bow down to and say you are you have the power over me the power is all the thing that is which is bringing all of this into existence and any human being no matter how powerful they are is just uh is just the light within the sun it's just it's it's an irrelevant um uh, thing so for instance it's like it's it's kind of like um, what is the world that a yid lives in? It's in a world with a bunch of friends, right? We're all here. Sun is the friend. The moon is the friend. A person is a friend. The big king is a friend. I'm not going to sit there bowing down to a king. He's 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 a he can exist, uh, and 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 somebody is a big powerful person. But that doesn't. I don't bow down to them, right? They they're just we we have to deal with them, um, and we and we're and we're all here like brothers and sisters in a big circle around Hashem. And this kind of way of relating is 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 a very 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 healthy way. And if and I'm not say if 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 that just this way of of relating to everything is understanding that we're all in a, in a circle 
and 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 all these entities are are equal equal in the relationship with the creator for instance right now the sun seems so powerful right oh the sun i'm getting all my energy from the sun the sun the sun i should bow down to it if i bow down to it then it's going to be my god but wait a second and i don't i'm not trying to become a uh, sci-fi on everybody and i know not everyone will like this but still it's, it's true so but we could we could leave the planet right we can go on a on in fact we did we went on our little trip to the moon right and then we have a space station and then we could collect energy from the sun and then we could go and live on another sun right i mean another planet next to another sun right we're not bound to that and while that sun who i thought i should bow down to is after a thousand um, millions of years whatever it is the number eventually will go out of existence life i.e. the Shekhinah, the, the life, might go out of existence. It has a very possibility. But because, uh, uh, but because um, I will die, it means that, that my, my people could live forever. Right? And what I, what I mean by that is because it's not just Pesachia, but that Pesachia will come into this world and then we'll have to let go, that a new, a new generation will arise and, that, and and be renewed means that life itself and and us human beings as well we have a capacity to outlive i know this sounds bizarre but we have a capacity to outlive the sun right but the sun is 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 finite so but how would i ever know that how would i ever have the audacity to think that way right is if i bow down to it i never would but if i realize that the sun is 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 a, is a, is a being right and I have so much to thank the sun for all of its its light, and I have so much to thank Jupiter for. There he is, uh, big Jupiter, and if uh, uh, taking in all the asteroids, right? So all of the asteroids and all the rocks that come flying around in space, they would be smashing Earth to bits, and we would never even be able to live. But Jupiter is so huge that they all get attracted to Jupiter, and they go flying into Jupiter. And so how much do we, how grateful do we have to be to Jupiter? Maybe we should bow down to Jupiter, right? But it's not, that's not true. Everything in this world was, is, is, uh, it was created with a lack. There's no sun without anything else, and there's no Sakya without Scott, and there's no, uh, uh, um, there's no Jupiter. There's no Earth without Jupiter, and there's no. There's no. Th this whole thing is like a a big uh, a big circle, a big everyone's holding hands, a big web of 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 life, and the thing that connects us to our Creator is the thing that of which we have a lack, and every single thing in this world has, and in, in this universe, and everything that is in this entire creation has a lack, and. It, nothing and is 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 the thing that you would bend your knee that you would bend your knee to. Even the most powerful person is gonna is going to uh, slip away. You, sh you don't you don't bend your knee to that. And this is even the same thing with the with the sun. Um. Anyways, so the uh, the um, so. Reb Shimon Bar Yochai, we were talking about Reb Shimon Bar Yochai. Reb Shimon Bar Yochai was, um, hello Julie. Uh, Reb Shimon Bar Yochai said that it was Esav's nature to have this hatred towards Yaakov. But that moment, now some people say that uh, why does it have the little dots over the kissing? It's like a special highlight in the Torah to show that something's funny there. So why why is the what's so strange about the kissing where Esav kissed Yaakov? So some people say because it wasn't a real kiss. But Shimon Bar Yochai, he says that although it was uh, although you know Yaakov uh, Esav hated Yaakov because of what he took away from him, right? It was just it was natural. That was a real moment there. And when Yaakov uh, was embraced by Esav, it was a real kiss. Meaning that in our lives, you would you you think. That the part of you, which is the which is the Asa, which is the part of you that is so um, set on on, on perfe out, outward perfection, religious perfection, be as pious as possible, or be as powerful as possible, or be as great as possible. That 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 that, that part of you would never accept uh, 
would never accept the heel, Yaakov. But at that point, Esav realized that it was that it that it was uh, uh, that it was good, and he uh, uh, and he was happy that Yaakov had had surpassed him. And he even says, "Let's go to Mount Seir." And Yaakov says, "You go first, and then I'll get there." Meaning that Yaakov still had more to accomplish. He still had more to to uh, to arise, which is the idea that Yaakov goes in first, and then Esav, and then Esav comes out, and then Yaakov. Meaning that the the rising of of Esav, the rising of the powerfulness and your accomplishments, comes before, and then the part of you that is the Akev, the part of you that is the things that you overlooked, are the one as the thing that rises up. Um, the thing that rises up second. So what we were talking about before was the vessels, right? So the vessels of of Yaakov were the things that he was willing to go racing across the river because he was at the stage of still having the hands of Asaph, meaning to have an effect in this world. Although he was a man of the tent, he knew that, that he had to go through a phase where he would he he had to prove himself by by making by doing something in this world, so even these little tiny vessels, the, meaning the the shell of surface things, he was willing to risk his life to go to go back and and get. And this is like the ace of the perfecting even the the tiniest vessels, and there he wrestles with uh, with ace of, which means what is the um, what is the mode of, uh, through which Yaakov, and again we keep going back and forth between the, the, the Yaakov and, and Esav in the story, Yaakov and Esav as a people, and the, the inner Yaakov and Esav, of, that is the twin that each one of us are. So how does the Yaakov emerge? The, the Yaakov emerges through a uh, fight, before the fight, right? It's not about the phys- there's going the, what's going to happen in the story is there's going to be a physical confrontation between Esav and his brother Yaakov. But Yaakov, how does the this part of you uh, win? How does this part of you come to uh, topple the part of you that was the one that was trying to be as powerful and perfect as possible? It happens at night and it happens uh, uh, like at the at the side of a river. Uh, wrestling with uh, wrestling with angels. Now, some uh, uh, there are some people that say that it's, it was wrestling with Hashem, and some people and our tradition is wrestling with the angel of Asaph. Those two can be the same because um, when you confront that, uh, uh, and when when this wrestling match is happening within you, it is a confrontation with Hashem. But the but what is really being confronted is the angel of Asaph. And what does it mean, um, angels? So, to get to that, to think about what it means to what we were talking about before, hi Ruben, what we were talking about before about the, uh, about relating to the world in a, in a way of that everything is its own entity. So, there's a, there's a way that I look at the natural world and I say, oh, this is the natural world and then there's the human world. But deeper than that is to realize that all of this is na- is natural, even the unnatural human world, and really all these distinctions are not are not so are not so clear, right? Uh, all these uh, hav- havdalot that uh, that we make are not so clear. But you have to go through the the uh, uh, the time of your life where you do make those you do so you can get things clear. Only when you can put things in their right place, then you can understand the uh, the distinctions. And when you understand the, the distinctions between things, and when everything has its place and everything has its own individual expression, only then could you unite everything together as a circle. But we the type of the refinement of the distinctions that we want to get is to the point that we're not taking big swaths of of things and 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 categorizing them all in one thing, right? You don't want to have uh, you know the good guys and the bad guys, right? What kind of you know that's the end of the. <laughs> how long can we do that for? You know, I guess for we we want to keep doing that. There's my side and your side, 
and there's all, all the you know there's the natural world and and the human world there's the this and there's that all the when it that's that's the first conception you have to get things down in big swaths right and then you have to realize that that's not those are all artificial right what's really going on is a whole bunch of entities right a whole bunch of beings like the Arizal says that the that 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 the stone has a soul and the and the plant has a soul and the and everything in this world uh, has a soul. The soul is the breath of Hashem telling it to be, come into existence. And just like we have a soul, so the, the, what is a soul? Soul means breath. So the breath of Hashem saying this should come into existence. That thing coming into existence has its own uh, existence, uh, has its own right. All, and along the circle, so instead of seeing things in like uh, in like a tree form, seeing things in in like the forest form, right? So there's I can see life as a as a tree of branching out into all these branches, but then I realize wait, it's all like a big forest, right? There's all these entities standing there, and we all need to relate to each other. Like I need to relate to the sun, and the sun is relating to me. And 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 although the sun looks like it's so uh, powerful, uh, he, and life uh, might outlive uh, the sun. M might or it might blow itself out of existence. Whatever it is that, uh, whatever it is that Hashem wants of it. Some great mountain, and then there's Reuven, right? It's not that the mountain is so great. Uh, uh, the mountain is is uh, is it has um, an advantage in his mountainness, and Ruvain has an advantage in his Ruvainness. And Psachia is the is the height of all Psachianess, and no one can top Psachia in his Psachianess. And Tali is the is the is the is the is the, the chief Tali, and nobody could you know nobody could top that that is a deep, that is the is 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 the deeper realization this is where Yaakov is starting to come in it's not about a hierarchy like Asaph is like i'm going to get to the top and i'm going to win and i'm going to be powerful but it's realizing no matter how how high my my tree goes no matter how high i'm it's all a relation with the rest of these beings and there and there's an equality to that relationship yes one thing is big but but uh, yeah, the sun is providing all the energy for this entire planet. But human life itself could actually leave the planet and could and could and could go uh, on a trip, and it didn't. Uh, and and the sun could go out of existence, and life could keep going. Right, the sun could burn out, and life could keep going. So what? Well, who was who was bigger? Who who was longer? Right? Maybe me, not Psachia. Psachia will will fade, and a new generation will emerge. But because of that. Because of that very weakness of mine, that I that I uh, can't live forever, then my next generation can go on, and while the sun just burns out. So I'm just saying that as an example. The same thing with it is with empires, right? The empire appears like it's the sun, and it gets real huge, and it's like the most powerful thing on the planet, and it says, "Oh, look at these Jews, you know, losers of of history, squashed." destroyed the Roman Empire so powerful yeah and then the Roman Empire blows itself out of existence and maybe you could say that the 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 empire continues in a, in its own way and uh, and the, and yet the Jews remain and and the, the empire knows it has a sneaking suspicion that eventually Yaakov will end up on top eventually all the people that the empires um, subjugated will end up on t on top and the empire will blow itself out you know it, it blows up and then it and then and then it fades away <clears throat> and therefore the uh, there was an advantage to its uh, like the gemara says that it's better to be the oppressed than to be the oppressor number one that's uh, maybe some people don't want to hear that <laughs> uh, but this is this is the wisdom of yakov it's the, it's the second wisdom there, the first wisdom is not letting anybody oppress you. That's Asaf, and that is part of each one of us. And I'm not saying that 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 someone should just be trampled upon. It's Asaf, and so you need to exert your power and not be trampled on. But that will then you realize the parts of your life where you need to, to you need to bend, and that the real winning is is the is the giving in, and that's the wisdom of of Yaakov. 
And that's the wisdom that is eternal, the wisdom that will last. I mean, this frail little life forms might outlive live the giant sun, right? The, the, the ability of me to not win everything in my relationships is, is the ability to keep the relationship for as long as, uh, as possible, right? And the idea of winning everything in the relationship is the thing that will blow the relationship out of, out of existence. So, or I mean, or it will be short-lived, right? So this wisdom is, is, a, is, the, is, the, is the deeper wisdom. And that, and that wisdom is connected with the idea that everything is in this relational, um, in this relationship of like, a, of like a forest or like a circle that is circling the creator, not like a hierarchy of who can get to the top of the mountain and win. So th- 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 that is related to the olam, shana, and nefesh, like the... Like, like the, uh, the Hasidus of the Baal Shem Tov, and it goes all the way back for generations, generations to the Sefi Yitzira. It's something that the, the Torah said over and over and over again that this whole world is made up of Olam, Shana, and Nefesh. Olam meaning place, Shana meaning year, but it all means in literally change that things are changing, and Nefesh, which is which is being, right, um, a body, soul, the, uh, a being, right. The relative experience, or the, or the, or, or, or the being. So there's there's the there's place, and so in place there's many different places, right? Each each place having its own uh, special personality uh, uh, in in space, right? But even though each place has its own personality, each place has its own advantage. They all there's no real um, line between any place, right? All borders are fake, and each one goes w- into w- into one another. And really, all of Olam is one single place, right? So there's all these different personalities to each place, but in truth, there's no lines between any of these places. It's just a single experience of place. There's the same thing with Shana with year. Every day is different. Every day has its own personality. Every day has its own thing that happened on that day. Each holiday is, has its own unique flavor. And every day in your life has its own thing that was learned in that day or that was accomplished in that day, whether it was the heights or it was low. But really, each day is connected to the other day. And there's no, there's no, uh, there, there's no uh, arbitrary line that gets... There's an arbitrary line that you would put down on there. But in truth, there's none. That it, It's really only one... It's a really only one uh, time, one moment. It's this a singular moment. It's the same thing with nefesh. Every being is 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 has its own distinct being, right? A sun is a, is amazing, and 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 a yid is amazing, and a and a cow is amazing, and a and a uh, and a um, a Roman legion. Is 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 amazing. You know, a legionnaire is amazing. Each one of these beings are there, and they each have their own place. But in truth, the, all beings. There's no. Even though this is the hardest, maybe for us to realize, is that is that there is no arbitrary line that goes between our beings. Each one of us, as we look out from our eyes, what is the being that is looking out from our eyes? What is the thing that we that is we are that is having the experience? That is a singular thing. The same eye that I am looking out from my eyes is is like it says in uh, in the Torah that the the lamp of 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 God is the soul of man, right? The soul inside, the one peering out of out of the, my eyeballs and and experiencing myself. That what is who is that peering out of there? Really, there's no the the you know each one of us is 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 experiencing ourselves, and that same uh, that same existence is a borrowed existence off of the uh, off of uh, existence itself, which is the thing that is existing and the thing that which is experiencing, which is. Uh, which is that singular nefesh, that singular being, and that singular being is the uh, is is uh, wrapped up in the olam shana nefesh, which is Hashem. So, what does that mean? That olam shana nefesh, like we said many times, is is uh, spells ashan, which is the smoke that it rises up 
It's like a like King Shlomo says that the uh, that everything is is hevel. Everything is like vapor, right? Everything is moving and shifting and changing in different places and beings, and but it's all one big uh, vapor, and it's all the just the experience and the encounter with Hashem. So what are these entities? What are what are right? Each one of them are so uh, so unique. So what are, if if they're an, if they're just a vessel for Hashem? If they're if each one of us beings and and now we're in the full expansive experience of beings, which is not just that there's human beings and there's all these other things that I'm not sure if they're really beings, but the rock has a soul and the tree has a soul and the sun. Each one of these have are are, are beings. So what are these what are these vessels? So each one of these vessels is, like we said earlier, is like a is like a shliach, right? Is like a messenger. Each one of the of, of the entities that come into this world are a messenger that's delivering something, right? Like Hashem speaks and the thing comes into being. I mean, what is the soul of of each one of the beings? Is the breath of Hashem bringing bringing it into speaking it into existence? And we're obviously not talking about a a uh, uh, physical mouth, but we're way beyond any of that. But we're talking in the, in the language of man, obviously, so we can understand it. But that, uh, this whole world is is information, and it's coming from somewhere. What is why why and what is happening? The this is being spoke into being, meaning it's a communication from the beyond all this. And what is that? So there's place, and there's change, and meaning what what. We come to understand this time, or whatever that is that we call, but it's the things that is constantly changing. And then there's all these beings. What are these beings? They are like bag. They're like a vessel, like a, like the little thing that Yaakov is chasing after to pick up. Every single entity, every single being in this world, is has a uh, has a little package inside. Right? It has its outer presentation, that this is what it is, but then it's carrying something that it's bringing into this world. And that's true for each one of the people that we meet and every being that we encounter. Right. So, for instance, I think that I, I, uh, I get a sheep, right, because I want to have, have some milk. So I think that what is, the, what is this being, what is it delivering me? It's delivering me milk. Then I realize it's also delivering me wool, and then I realize also it's delivering me meat. So I say this is once I get that I, because the Jew, Jewish people are uh, shepherds, and the, a lot of the metaphors are, are with flocks. So when I look at the sheep, I say this is it's it's outer surface, and uh, and what is it what is it delivering? What is it bringing into this world? It's bringing in. Um, uh, <clears throat> Milk and, and wool and meat. Now that's a very big gift that it's bringing by, right? I say, wow, it's um, really uh, grateful to it. But like the Rambam says, that you shouldn't think that every being is coming into existence for you, right? That when you, if you want to understand what is this, what are these entities delivering into this world, you can't think of it as the purpose of these things are to deli- They actually came for their own Shabbat Shalom Chaim. They actually came for their own purpose. They came for their own... They have their secret mission, right? They have an outward mission. The outward mission is like the bag, like the, the thing that I thought I wanted. But then it, then it brought friendship, too, right? I thought it was coming for... Because it, it was bringing meat and, and milk. And then, I, and then I realized, wait, it wasn't bringing meat and milk and wool. It was actually bringing uh, friendship and, and with uh, an intimacy with an uh, with an entity with this being that is the encounter itself of just relating to it like i could go buy meat i could go buy milk i could go buy wool but then i wouldn't then i didn't have what it was actually delivering which was this itself the, which is the intimacy with it Th- this understanding is the is 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 the very 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 it's essential to a human being to understand that the the uh, beings are not there to uh its its purpose is not is not for what you give it it has it has its own secret uh purpose and it has many purposes it's delivering many things that that we're not aware of like 
for instance, it's bringing it's bringing friendship and and intimacy with the, the, the this, this amazing being, and then wait, I see that that the taking care of it is bringing my family together, right? So what was also in the package of its entity? It was it was it was friendship and it was family that I was bringing, and then I see that there's all this Torah that I'm learning from it, right? The way it acts and the way it, it mates, and the way it, it comes into being, and all these things that I'm learning. So then what was it also, what was it also a shliach? And what we say in, in the Torah, that, that, that is a, that, which is a malach. A malach, in, when you translate it in English, as an angel. But what it, what it means is to be a messenger. So it was a messenger from Hashem. So what was this malach? What was this angel? Right? It says that with everything... Uh, every being, there's an angel saying to it, grow, 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 right? With every leaf, there's an angel saying, grow, grow, grow. What is this angel? What is the message? Not the mess- Not just the message, meaning a visual to hear what Hashem is saying through the existence of this being, but as a messenger, what is it bringing into, the, into this world? And then I see it's bringing us so much depth and so much wisdom. And, and I say, wait, I learned so much. Right, like what, what did what did the Jewish people learn from sheep? We learned that that Hashem is our shepherd, and we learned the 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 way in which a sheep relates to each other in this in this in this humble and beautiful way. And I learned we learned character traits from it, right? And we learned how to relate with one another. And we learned we learned so much. And and I thought I could only learn from someone who talked with uh, fancy words. And here a sheep is is giving me so much, and and it was it was a mess. It's like a like a like a messenger, like literally like an angel, that coming from Hashem, bringing this thing into this world. Now I can see that about sheep. We can just keep going on and on. I look at a person. Initially, I think of the person in, as as uh, as an enemy, or I think of the person as a. A competition with me, even if not an enemy, like we're trying. But then, if I think, why? What is the? What are they a messenger for? What are they delivering to this world? And the, and let's say they are in competition with me. So they're so. And as I compete with them, I I get stronger and stronger and stronger. So they brought me that strength, right? If we look back into our lives, to all the people that we say were nothing but trouble for us, we'll realize that. Okay, they brought trouble, but what was what was Hashem sending them into our lives for? Why did they exist? So we realize how much strength we actually actually had through dealing with them. All the things that we learned through through the contrast and through the competition. But even more than that, there's even more deeper, deeper things, and I don't want to get into it, you know. So, but it just it uh, that uh, that uh, when before someone davens. Or when someone is in hits or in the in the woods and or sitting by themselves or has a moment to think, go back to all of these entities and I don't want to keep using the word entity. I don't, you know, all these beings, all these nefesh, nefesh, all of these these breath uh, and all these souls in this world, and look and think back about all the tremendous things that each one of them was delivering, and then. You, we, and when I'm not talking about people, not just people, but also um, the beings in your life, and realizing that they're delivering more than 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 we think, and then you got, can get to a deeper level. You say, well, there's even more hidden, hidden, hidden deliveries, right? And that is especially in my life, right? So I thought I was supposed to do this in my life, right? Because I wanted to do it, and then. I realized that I could do this, and then all of a sudden I realized I'd rather do this, and then it, right. So as my life is developing, I'm realizing all of these different reasons what I was delivering into this world, which, which sometimes I look back and think I never could even have imagined when I was uh, younger that that this is what I this is what I would do, right. And I'm not saying because one fails at one thing, but just that there's so much that one uh, can can bring to this world. And then you look back and you say, what about the mistakes that I made and the things that I did? And you say, okay, that was a mistake. And I always told myself this story about what a big mistake I made. And then I realized what actually happened there and all these other things that were being delivered. And that's the idea of Yaakov, like the idea of the heel, right? Like the, 
the the you think that that Asaph is being delivered, right? Like it's in, in a pregnancy, the babies are delivered, right? You think it's Asaph being delivered, and then right when the last drop of Asaph comes out, Yaakov's hand comes and grabs and says, "This is what's really, this is what's really coming. This is the." the secret journey. So everywhere we go in life, we think we're accomplishing one thing, and that's true on a surface level. That's how we become. But we're actually accomplishing accomplishing a different a, a different secret journey that we're bringing things into this world. Like, um, like the Baal Shem Tov says can, uh, that, a per, that it's possible that a person came into this world just to accomplish a good deed uh, just to help another person w- once in their life, right? So that is, they wouldn't even notice that. It's not like they would realize it at that moment. But that, and and it's not just that that's the only thing, but they, uh, but there's this journey, this secret journey happening in your life that is happening at the same time as your, your, your external journey. Everything that I can understand and everything that I'm doing and I'm acting and I'm like, trying to accomplish and I'm trying to do what's right and, and trying to succeed, and all of a sudden, at the same time, everything that I can't succeed in, and everything that it's, I'm letting slip, and I'm not, I'm not able to even notice. Then, when I look back, I notice all these things that I that I delivered into this into this world. That I was a messenger for all these all these moments. Like, for instance, sometimes a person makes a mistake, but eventually, you see that how that mistake plays out is actually it was even greater than what you thought you were going the the great thing that you thought you were accomplished right so well it's almost 11 but that and and so we should probably finish up but the, the that experience of of um of the first the uh, ace of emerging and then Yaakov coming in is the is the experience that is going on in this parsha, and like we said before, that eventually, um, uh, uh, eventually Yaakov uh, is embraced by Esav. Meaning, eventually, the 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 the, the, um, the parts of Yaakov that were like. Um, The thing that 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 was that that Asa was striving not to be, Asa realizes that that there was this great advantage to it, and you see at the end of the parsha, and we'll finish up soon. But the, you see at the end of the parsha that it says that these are the kings of Asa, that and and it's literal. That it says that these are the the kings of Asa. Where is it? Um, these are the kings of Asaph that ruled in the land of Edom before there was a king in the sons of Israel. Velo Malachim Asher Malchu Be'eretz Edom Lifnei Malach Melech Lifnei Israel. Right. So even at the at the end of the the parsha is 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 showing the the structure, right? So these are the this is the kings of Asaph that came to power before there was a king in Israel. That this that this is a proper order. That first Asaph emerges. And then there's the king in in Israel. And I want to give everybody a bracha that we will realize that all of us um, have these twins inside of us, the Esav and and the Yaakov, and that we shouldn't see our weaknesses as as um, as bad, like from the Esav perspective. And we shouldn't see our power as bad, like from the Yaakov perspective. But we should be able to realize that we need to be Yaakov, with the meaning having the inner quality, and then also the hands of Esau, to be able to accomplish something in this world. And that we, and that we see that even Esau realizes that in the end. He ends up marrying someone uh, <laughs> named Yehudas, because he, wants, he, he tries to uh, acclimate a, a part of him that is that is Jewish. In fact, Esav gets to the to his ultimate fruition even before Yaakov. He says, "I'll meet you in Harsir," and Yaakov says, "I'll get there later," meaning that Yaakov has more work to do, that the that his his path is slower. And so I give us the bracha that uh, that we should realize that both our Esav and our Yaakov are a singular uh, being. 
that when 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 part is uh, when you know when one part is up the other part is down and the other part is down the other part is up but then there's if we realize that we're, it's a singular being there's no part that's down there's no part that's up it's a singular being so when one part of you is being expressed and the other one is is inside that is it's proper and when one part one one part of your of yourself is being expressed in this moment the other one will will soon be expressed and that's the idea that each one of the of the beings is really one singular being and that every single moment is really one singular moment and that every single place there's no arbitrary lines between place and they are all it's all connected as as a singular place and that each one of these levels that go into this world of olam shan nefesh are really a single thing and I give us a bracha that we should be able to uh, have that inner quality and inner uh, uh, spirit to be able to hold that both on the inside and on the outside. And those are the the uh, the signs of of kashrus. So good Shabbos to everybody.